welcome to our monthly webinar series. Um, this month, we're actually going to be talking about probably not everybody's favorite topic, uh, but something that's extremely important to think about is end of life decisions uh, for horses. So again, this may not be what makes people really excited to think about, but it's really important that we've thought about these things um, somewhere in our horses' lives. So what I'm gonna cover tonight uh, is a little bit of discussion and thought about when maybe it's time um, to make that decision if we're talking about euthanasia with our horses. Um, certainly there are uh, times that these losses are unexpected and not planned for. Um, so that does take some planning even for unplanned losses um, some real practical consideration over what we do um, with the remains. Um, quite a bit different story than what we would do with pets, dogs, or cats, etc. Um, and then just a little bit of advice for individuals um, relative to, to moving on and dealing with loss. So we'll get started. Um, again, thinking about uh, when is it time for considering ending the life of your horse. I want to remind everybody that this is a personal decision um, and something that individuals need to make with consideration of facts, but feelings are a big part of that. Um, and not every decision is going to be the same for different individuals. And we'll talk about that a little bit further. Um, also recognize there are some realities when we're talking about horses that even your own life circumstances um, can change. Um, are you uh, maybe in different financial situation than before? You know, finances are a big consideration. Um, do you no longer have the ability to care for that horse properly? Um, age of owners, um, children moving out. I mean, there's lots of things that may affect the circumstances that may change your decision um, over your horse's lifespan. But for our horse, um, some key points to think about, we need to consider the quality and quantity of their life. So quality uh, certainly is about level of pain, which we'll talk about. Um, does that horse have a high quality of life? And then quantity of life. You may make a different decision for a younger horse than you may with a older horse that you know is nearing uh, the end of their lifespan. Um, how much pain the animal is in. I think it's important that we have conversations with our veterinarians that are perhaps maybe more objectively obsessing, uh, assessing the level of your horse's pain. Um, you know, chronic pain that is mild is different than chronic pain that is severe. Um, or do we have an expectation that, yes, this horse may experience some significant pain for a short period of time, but this is something that we can recover from. Um, Long-term outcomes are also important considerations. You know, that classically laminitic horse or one that's um, been foundered, it may take two years to get that horse back to normal. So we really need to, again, have these discussions with veterinarians, also other people, because it can be really easy to get caught up in that ourselves um, and not be very objective over what's actually happening with that horse. Um, and again, I will emphasize this quite a bit as we go on, but financial resources are a real consideration. Um, you know, it's every horse owner's sort of dread or nightmare that your horse has that uh, severe colic that then our veterinarian recommends surgery, and that can easily be a five or $10,000 bill. Um, and so sometimes our finances dictate what treatment options we have and whether euthanasia may be um, part of that consideration. So again, I wanna really emphasize that there is no right or wrong. Um, this is based, you know, sometimes on your background. Um, we tend to think about individuals that maybe come from more of a agricultural background that may be dealing with um, either animals on a larger number or have dealt with these decisions on a more regular basis that may be more familiar with that. Um, 
if you come from a production background versus viewing an animal more as a companion, that can alter what that individual's decision is going to be. We also have the reality, sometimes horses are, are businesses um, and we have financial stakes involved with those horses um, versus some horses may mean more as an individual. So even if you owned 10 horses, there may be that one horse that means a little bit more. Um, that is important for, for the family or those personal bonds that you've had that maybe that horse um, has special considerations. Um, and we can't forget that, you know, our horses live a long time. And so a horse can easily have a 20 or 30 year lifespan. That's decades. So if you can think about everything that's happened in you know, your own life, so it is quite possible that an owner could have a horse at their house longer than they would actually have their children. We think the children would move out, but that horse may still be there. And so those really long lasting relationships that have gone on for so long, those can be really hard to um, have come to an end. So again, no right or wrong. These are all okay feelings for people to have when they're considering um, end of life for their horse. Um, again, I'm going to emphasize this is your decision. Um, others may disagree with you. So the circumstances are not the same for everybody. Everybody's consideration over equine life is not the same. Um, so I may, you know, my always suggestion a lot of times is avoid social media, even though hopefully we have people joining us uh, via Facebook right now. Uh, but sometimes you can have a lot of vitriol or people with really negative opinions that you may not need right, right then at that moment. Um, again, we talked about colic surgery can be a substantial cost. And if we can't afford that with causing um, financial pressures, then that may not be an option for you. And even on our older horses, um, they're really more expensive to feed. So, you know, on average, a 50 pound bag of senior feed is around $21. Well, that, you know, older horse may need 15 pounds of that feed per day. Well, if we do the math really quickly, that's $6.30 per day. So that horse may have a $200 a month feed bill compared to a horse that's able to eat, you know, less of a bag feed or a concentrate feed and more forage. So these are real considerations that we need to think about. And I would always say horses are a tough subject because our horses dwell in um, two different worlds, so to speak. So they are in our, uh, they're considered to be pets. They're considered um, to be business investments. They may be tools or resources for us. So horses really um, run the gamut from traditional agriculture um, to companions and, and pets. So um, often lots of different feelings about uh, horses and end of life decisions. So another option um, perhaps for owners to think about, um, if your horse is no longer as usable for you, he may still be able to be successful in another career. Uh, maybe it's not suitable for you anymore, but perhaps could be a walk trot horse or, or you know, walk um, if that's all the horse needed to do. Um, uh, as a companion pasture buddy for other horses, that certainly may be a, a, a different career for that individual. Um, and even donations. So um, some uh, veterinary hospitals, and, and OSU does do this some, um, may take horses to be part of their teaching herd. Um, so our veterinary students need animals uh, to practice handling and different procedures. Um, and certainly um, terminal studies may be an option as well. So individuals that may have some unique illnesses um, or circumstances that our veterinary students can learn quite a bit from them, um, that's a, a great way for for your horse to kind of continue their service. And so a lot of owners appreciate having that option um, where that horse is able to, um, like I said, continue, continue the, his mission or serving um, a little bit longer. So again, reality is costs are an issue. It is okay for this to be part of your decision. Um, we have to consider the welfare of the horse. And again, sometimes talking with your veterinarian or another 
um, individual that can give you a more objective opinion may help you say, well, it probably is time um, to let the source go. And then in the reality, we, we want to make sure we're not forgetting um, public image. If we have a horse that isn't doing very well, is lame, really under condition, and individuals can see that animal in our pastures, um, you can expect there may be a fair number of phone calls made by the neighbors or individuals passing by, um, and it may be your best intention to do everything right for that horse, but that can, can be a challenge. Um, so we definitely don't want to shy away from what, what's actually happening. <clears throat> so, um, again, I want to make sure that we're being pretty clear about um, costs. And so we talked about, well, there may be cost decisions, whether we can afford treatment for a horse or need to consider euthanasia um, or cost to care for an, for an older horse. But there's cost to end of life that we have to think about um, as well. So I have uh, did my research on essentially what would happen for me um, where I live in my uh, individual. So I did uh, call my veterinarian and ask, you know, what did their services cost? So for the um, euthanasia, essentially at my house, so if my horse had not already gone into the clinic and something had happened, but euthanasia at my house would be um, uh, $200 with an exam if we hadn't already been treating that animal. Um, and my veterinarian also offers uh, disposal as well, so that would be part of the, the cost, so they will uh, assist you with the disposal of the remains. So, but it's something to think about that, that in reality, that end of life may um, be a substantial cost that you need to think about and not be shocked um, when the time comes. And then also, while well, in this circumstances, uh, she would help dispose of the remains, there's other legal carcass disposal options, and we're gonna talk about all of that. What are your options in Oklahoma and what's legal? Um, because we definitely want you to do what's, what's legal, but really be aware of what the law is and, and what options are out there for you. So um, wanted to make sure owners are aware of um, euthanasia and essentially what occurs. So, um, most of the time, horse owners, because we've had pets as well, are probably familiar more with um, using barbiturates or sodium pentobarbital. Um, essentially, it's a drug overdose, uh, overdose. So when we think about putting an animal to sleep, that's typically you know, the method that we uh, think about. Um, other AVMA approved uh, methods, though, are also the use of captive bolt. Um, as well as gunshot. So we will talk a little bit about uh, captive bolt and gunshot. Um, it's important um, to know if you're going to use gunshot, you have to do it correctly. That is the key part of that. So accurate placement and then a correct caliber of gun is necessary if we're going to do this humanely um, and result in instantaneous death. Um, now, this is something that a lot of people uh, don't think about, but, but the location that this may occur, and this is also with, you know, maybe our unexpected loss, um, horses are big, we need to be able to move um, the body, and so animals that die in stalls or in buildings where we don't have good access by, you know, machinery, tractors, essentially to move the body, that can be really difficult. So we have to think about that. Um, so sometimes people will think about, well, maybe if we're going to bury, we'd actually have the, the site already prepared if this is a planned euthanasia and then the horse could be euthanized close um, or even within the, the burial site. Um, if we need to transport the body and you know that, euthanasia safely if possible within trailers or thinking about how are we gonna get that horse's body onto a trailer for um, removal. These are real considerations that, that people need to think about uh, before it's time. So part of what this uh, webinar is about is really think about those decisions or, or the, your plan ahead of time, because if you're upset in, in the middle of something that, that you had not either planned for or grief stricken, these nuts and bolts procedures are probably not what everybody wants to think about. Um, so again, this is why we're talking about this is for people to have that thought process already. 
So just some uh, notes about different methods of euthanasia, and I have um, witnessed different methods. Um, so one thing that owners may not realize that uh, that barbiturate um, overdose is not instantaneous. And so um, you need to have a conversation with your veterinarian if you want to be around during this process or not. Um, I think you need to be very honest with them over what you're able to witness or handle um, and be prepared for that. And they're probably, um, you really need to have that conversation with your veterinarian before any procedure would begin. Um, recognize too, what we do with the body, with a horse that has been euthanized with a barbiturate is really important to consider. While this is really, really unpleasant for people to think about, um, poisoning due to carcass consumption via pets and wildlife is well documented. Um, I had an experience um, when I was teaching at a different university and we used to do some euthanasias as part of our curriculum, learning about anatomy and end of life decisions. Um, and this is a terrible story, but my dog had actually um, ingested some of the blood from that horse and that almost killed him. So we don't think about that very often, but that's a real risk and we have to consider what are we going to do. Um, there's even been a report of some dogs that were poisoned by a carcass that had been buried for two years. Um, so hadn't, hadn't uh, decayed, they got into it. Um, and I think one dog died and the other one was sick. Uh, for quite a while. So something to consider. Um, captive bolt and gunshot, you know, why I bring this up? Um, because our average, our average horse owner is not going to be um, probably using this methodology. Um, but if it's done correctly, it is uh, instantaneous. So that can um, really be a a way to end all suffering rather quickly. Again, it is an instantaneous death um, and certainly one that needs to be considered in emergencies. So we think about that law enforcement with highway accidents. Um, I've had uh, one of my former students that had to euthanize a horse when she was working as a wrangler out west that a horse had suffered a catastrophic injury during a trail ride. Um, I have uh, ridden with folks in Norway and they, that's part of their reality because of the mountainous terrain. They have to be prepared to euthanize a horse if necessary, if, if something tragic uh, would happen. Um, this method can also be used with tranquilizers to make the horse um, calm and less likely to move in the event that we need to do this. Um, so essentially, uh, my diagram here, again, while people may not want to think about that, is a traditional drawing an X across the horse's forehead. Essentially, it's about an inch lower from where their forelock um, begins. And we want to go essentially parallel with the neck so that we are um, destroying the brain and again, rendering the horse immediately insensible um, at that time. Um, and a, a, an advantage, I guess, if people want to think about advantages to, to these things is there's no drugs in the body. And so um, it is safe if our pets or other wildlife might get access to the remains. So uh, moving on to, to what do we do? Okay, so we've either had a horse die or uh, we've euthanized a horse. So the approved methods of disposal for um, large animal carcasses in Oklahoma are incineration, rendering, landfills, compost, and burial. So we're going to talk about um, each one of these and what might be an option um, for those. So incineration, um, cremation really is the same thing as incineration, generally just different facilities that will do that. Um, recognize open fires are not allowed. Um, that is illegal in the state of Oklahoma as a method of carcass disposal. So it has to be done in a facility designed for large animal carcasses. Um, cremation um, can be done with private um, cremations or mixed. The difference, if it's a private cremation, you would get only your horse's ashes back. Mixed, it would be sort of a subsample of what would be happening. 
Um, there are two facilities in Oklahoma that do do cremation for horses, so Precious Pet Cemetery and Pet Memories Cremation Service, both of those do cremations. Um, the other option is incineration. Um, and here in Oklahoma, our diagnostic lab on the OSU campus will do um, incinerations of large animals. So the cost of incineration uh, for a horse in Oklahoma, again at our diagnostic lab, depends on body size. So it's the reality. So as little as $55 for essentially a pony up to $175 for a large horse. So um, that is typical fee for horses. Um, but that does not include transportation. So you would need to um, deliver the horse to Odal in order for that to take place. Um, costs of cremation are going to be a, a much more expensive. This is a large animal and again they are, they're doing these typically one at a time so that you get your own horse's ashes back. Um, so as much as, as $12.50 um, per horse. Um, and then if you did buy an additional urn, and these are designed for horses because you can expect about 40 pounds of ash back. Um, so you may be thinking somewhere in, a, in the realm of 15 to $1,600 for a horse to be um, cremated. So something to think about again ahead of time before those financial um, considerations come to fruition. The other option are landfills. Um, and so I'm sorry, this is a little bit blurry. I grabbed this off of a PDF from the Department of Ag in Oklahoma. But this lists the landfills that accept livestock or not. Um, so that's important to know if your local landfill will even take um, a horse. Um, and so I found the most recent version of this was from 2014. So I uh, followed, if, if I live in Payne County, so who would I call? Um, and so I looked at my list here and called my number. Uh, and that actually only just went to an answering machine with not, without a message. Um, so then I tried to do a little tracing with um, the landfill service, so the waste disposal service. Um, and so that number that you would find on a website, that does not take you to the right people at all. Um, so I had to search specifically and find my landfill's phone number. So that took me a little while. I uh, spoke to some folks um, and I found out that for my county's landfill where I live, I would have had to have given them a 24 hour notice before I would bring the horse. So that's important to think about because we're gonna talk about 24 hours in a little bit. Um, and so recognize my, my landfill needs that 24 hour notice before they would be able to be ready for that animal. Um, so cost is relatively low. So they would take a horse for about $83. But again, I had to do a little bit of research ahead of time to figure out what I would need to do. Um, and, that's me in just a normal frame of mind, not if it's something catastrophic had happened. Um, an important consideration, and this would be either if you were taking a horse um, to an incineration cremation or a landfill, when you're transporting that animal, the body cannot be exposed to public view. You're not allowed to drive a trailer down the road with an animal that is dead in it that is exposed. It has to be covered with a tarp um that could get you in some trouble so do think about those things before again before you before you need to another option in oklahoma um, is m m disposal service so um, mike is the individual um, that's her actually in this picture that runs that service um, she charges uh, 280 dollars to dispose of a horse um, if it's within her 60 mile radius and she's based out of tecumseh um, she would charge an additional mile um, over that. Um, and if for some reason there were two individuals or two animals at the same time, um, she does have a discounted rate for that. Um, when I chatted with her, um, it's not uncommon for lightning. Um, if animals are standing together, that lightning can arc through them and you may actually, this is, this is real, end up with several um, dead animals after uh, such an event. Um, also, just to know, she will take animals that um, have been euthanized in any manner. Uh, if, we, if anyone ever moves out of state, recognize that um, 
there are some rules about barbiturates and what happens with that carcass. So rendering services um, cannot take them because we do not want those entering into the food chain, um, pet supply, et cetera. So I know, again, not very pleasant for people to think about, uh, but it's an 1100 pound carcass and, and th this is a reality. So, um, but just to re rest assured, the animals that my takes are with m, m disposal service do not enter the food chain. So, um, at all. So um, that is not part of the process of what happens with them. Um, but she's actually very kind and considerate. And so again, I would, um, she's an option for you. Um, burial um, may be a pretty common option to think about. Um, however, if the animal has died from communicable, communicable diseases, burial may not um, be the correct option. So think about that. Again, talk with your veterinarian. Um, we really need to think about groundwater contamination when we're burying um, large animals. And again, I had already mentioned if pets or wildlife have access to that carcass and, and can ingest that, they can be um, really sick uh, from the drugs that may be used, or even if they're getting into you know, decaying carcasses, that may not be the best thing for your pet. So for burial, um, some rules that we're going to go over, the um, animal has to be placed in a burial pit that is 300 feet from any water body. So that would include streams or rivers, ponds, lakes, as well as wells. So at a minimum 300 feet, any direction from any water source. So that's important to think about with your um, site selection. Um, so other rules, these are the official rules for Oklahoma. Uh, so like I said, we have to be 300 feet from water. You have to have the bottom of that burial pit one foot above the floodplain. So that's not the top of your dirt. Um, and two feet above bedrock. So we don't want to get down into the bedrock. And you need to be two feet above seasonal high water. So um, it's important you really understand your land um, before you choose a burial site. And then the animal has to be buried with two and a half feet of dirt. Um, and that's to ensure, again, nothing has access uh, to that carcass. So um, heavy machinery is going to be um, needed. Um, this isn't something that one can do rather quickly. So that's part of our plan that we're going to talk about as we go on. Um, so site selection, again, and, and having the right equipment is going to be really important. Um, some other rules, uh, these are again Oklahoma rules for burial. Um, any site has to be located a quarter mile from a highway. Um, now I did put in some questions over what constitutes a highway. I didn't know if that meant a paved road or if we're truly talking about like 35, highway 35 or interstates or what is a highway. So if anybody has any questions on that, I'll try to follow up specifically. Um, or occupied dwelling. So we also need to be a quarter mile from a house. So unless you have substantial property, that's going to really put some constraints on you. Um, the other rule is that the animal has to be buried within 24 hours. Um, so remember I said our, my landfill needs a 24 hour notice. Um, so we need to think about that. What is that time frame? You have all of those pieces ready and, and ready to put into play with um, backhoes, et cetera, in order to bury that animal within 24 hours. Um, it is a criminal misdemeanor if you put an animal in the wrong site. So this is uh, punishable. Um, and the other part of this rule is you are not allowed to just have animals be unexposed. Um, I did not see where it was uh, where it could be prosecuted, but certainly your neighbors are not going to appreciate that. Um, and realize when I'm talking about this, there's a, a vast difference between if we're in a um, suburban area or if we're in the panhandle of Oklahoma with vast tracts and uh, sections of land. Um, so, but, but again, I'm gonna emphasize what the law is. Um, you cannot leave an animal uncovered. Um, so the other key piece, uh, again, on burial is actually, like I said, think about your site location, think about what has to happen, but also know your soil. So um, how do you know if you are even allowed to bury on your property or should you bury on your property? 
So um, there is a site that can actually tell you that. So if you go to the Web Soil Survey, so this is a site that is hosted by USDA. Um, and if you click on this little green button here, you can begin investigating your soil type. So we'll talk about getting to um, burials with animals, but you can actually learn quite a bit about your soil type, so productivity and some other information that you might find in handy pasture management, for example. So um, again, I followed what would happen if um, I had a uh, loss of a horse. And so I essentially typed in my address when we do our search button here. Um, and then you draw essentially your area of interest around your property. So I don't expect everybody to show up, but this is essentially where I live um, with the house in the back. And then these are pastures um, for horses that we have here. Um, so now when I ask this site for information, it's going to be very specific with my property. So um, when I go through and you click on the disaster and then there will be a section there where you can look for um, large animal um, disposal, what it will actually tell you, so we're looking at a catastrophic event um, for large animal mortality. Um, so it maps out your property. So I kind of had a little bit of, of fun doing this, again, even though this seems a little bit morbid, but this tract of land here, so this is, it's technically this piece right here. Um, there's no limitation to any burial on this tract of land. So everything that is here in this bright green means it's good to go. Um, this tract of land here is slightly limited. So this would indicate this isn't the best, the best site of anything um, that I have. And then where it is shaded in here in red, that would be a terrible idea. <laughs> so, so there should be no um, carcass disposal in this um, red area. So I will say that my soil map tells me that I can bury um, here, but um, I also know that my driveway is a quarter mile. So this is my property. So my horse would have to be buried here to keep it away um, from any other house, except I have a neighbor over here. So I'd actually be violating that rule. Um, so I'd actually probably have to ask my neighbor's permission to use other parts of their property. Not that I'm doing that or advocating that, uh, but it's kind of a good exercise and well, is this legally um, a possibility for me or not? So the other alternative that uh, I would encourage people to consider um, is actually composting. So nice thing about composting, the key to fermentation in that process will actually destroy pathogens. So if we have communicable diseases, this is actually kind of a, a good way to um, dispose of the remains. Um, it does give you more site locations. So because I'm not varying, my soil type isn't going to be as important. I still need to consider where I would do my compost, uh, but it's not gonna be as restricted as a burial site. So that um, may come in kind of handy. Um, the other nice thing is that if I do compost my horse, I actually get a usable product. And, and while that may seem a little callous or cold, but that could also be a great way to memorialize your horse. So you could um, essentially use the compost to help fertilize pasture or incorporate it into a garden, um, flowers, et cetera, that may, you may use to say this is the area you know, that would represent my horse. So it may be a great way for people to still feel pretty connected um, to that animal and have them still part of your property and your land. So compost, um, if you're thinking about site locations, we do want it elevated, but not sloped. So we don't want to encourage water runoff at all. So not a slope site, just elevated. So not in a low lying area. You still have to follow the rules about how close are you to water, so 300 feet from any streams, ponds, or wells. Um, and then the other great suggestion is that once we've actually um, built our compost, and I'll give you some information on that, put a barrier around it, and that can be pretty, you know, knock some T-posts into the ground, some quick wire around there, or use some paneling. And that's just gonna help your compost pile actually retain its shape pretty well instead of you know, some of the um, carbon source kind of pushing down away. Um, and it keeps animals out as well. So it would encourage you to do that. And so this is actually a picture of uh, an equine compost um, pyramid here. 
So pile construction, again, we're really thinking practical here. Essentially, you're going to build a pyramid around the animal's remains. So we wanna have a good base. So essentially you would build your carbon base um, before you would place the horse on top. So 18 to 24 inches of our carbon material would be our pad or base. So we would place the animal on that base and then we're essentially going to build up around the animal with at least kind of our two foot depth surrounding every part of that animal. And that's going to help, again, our, we're adding carbon so this fermentation process can take place. Um, it really eliminates any odor. I've not seen any reports, read any reports of odor being an issue with composting um, large animal mortalities um, and helps trap that heat in there. Uh, if we're looking for carbon source, the nice thing is that a lot of horse owners are going to have this on hand already. So wood shavings um, are great. Straw can be used, but it needs to be chopped, not just like shake the flakes loose. That's not going to work. Um, any wood chips, so if we're sending, you know, our trees or um, things like that through a chipper branches that we may have cut down, those can work. Um, and even stall cleanings. Um, so the manure actually mixed in with there helps us off with a little bit of bacteria to get started. Um, adds a little extra nitrogen, can really get that pile heated up and getting it uh, working for us quickly. So successful compost, um, again, uh, carbon source. So we don't wanna just pile dry wood, uh, pile dry wood shavings on our remains and walk away. We actually need to add moisture in. Um, so our carbon source needs to be about 50% moisture. So what, what is that? Um, so if we grabbed a handful, it could kind of squeeze together, but it will not drip water. Okay, so that would be too wet. We don't want that. Um, the other suggestion is if you're actually moistening your carbon source with pond water, that, that can also kind of speed things up because it's got such a good amount of bacteria and microbes in it to get us going in that fermentation process. So just kind of some tips and tricks uh, for successful composting. If you've done it correctly, um, your essentially compost pile can be finished in as little as 120 days. So that's not very long at all. Um, so a four month period, we would be able to take the, um, take the animal, um, we would turn that pile and then this would be um, compost that would be ready to be used. Um, you would not expect really to see much remains. There may be a few of the large bones, but they'd be very brittle um, and break up rather easily. So really a very, very acceptable method um, for disposal. Um, and again, there are some fact sheets available through Oklahoma State that give you much more detail if you really want the details over successful composting. But again, something um, that, that may be a really viable option. Um, so one note um, about pentobarbital and compost. Um, our, one of our researchers, Dr. Josh Payne, here at Oklahoma State, um, did a study with um, some equine carcasses that had been um, euthanized with pentobarbital or a different method, captive bulls. Um, and then he followed the compost in the process. It took only 120 days, but he kept the compost piles around and would test that. And they still found um, the pentobarbital residue uh, 365 days uh, later, so a long time. Um, but I don't want anybody to panic um, and think about, oh, this is going to kill your pet, because think about we're, we're diluting that all through the carbon source. And so it's not like the pet is gonna come and eat the wood shavings and the, the compost, that's not normal. And again, think about how much it is di diluted out. Um, so it's still safe from that standpoint. Um, and I did look and, and at the moment, there has not been sufficient research really done to figure out how much um, is in the soil is detrimental. So just a, a word of caution, again, not panic, but just some thoughts about um, where is that compost gonna go? Is it gonna go right in your water source, et cetera? Um, so the, the biggest part of this lecture really is thinking about have a plan. Um, and it is okay if your plan changes, right? So, and I would encourage everybody in that family to have that discussion when we're talking about the end of life portion. 
think about that before the moment comes, before your horse ever colics, before they are 29, have that conversation, you know, and again, if the plan changes, that's okay. And if your plan is different for that one special horse, that's okay too. But it, but it helps to talk about it and have that thought process made before the crisis happens. Um, and then the reality, do, depending on what disposal method you're gonna use, if you're gonna use burial, you need to know it's okay already. Have that site picked out, follow these guidelines, check it out. Um, and you have to call somebody, have that number available on your phone to find that backhoe because again, you've got 24 hours to dispose of that animal. Um, you may not be in the right frame of mind. Um, if you're using cremation or incineration, already know who to call. Have that number, do your research ahead of time. Check prices ahead of time. Is this something that I can afford? Um, and remember, you still have to get the animal there. So how is that gonna happen? I mean, it, do you have experience using tractors? And, and this is sad, but the reality of you need to move that 1,100 pound animal onto a motor vehicle so that you can take it to where it needs to go. Um, if you're gonna compost, you still have to have your site determined. Um, and then we still have to be able to, to move the carcass. Um, and certainly it's conceivable that the pad could already be built if we're gonna do a euthanasia work with your veterinarian. So you do need to think about that. How are we actually going to move that animal? Have your carbon source there ahead of time and again, have that site picked out. These are really important steps for people to take before you're at that moment. Um, and then again, remember that people can form really, really strong attachments to horses. And that is correct and acceptable. Again, we may have a horse with us for decades of their life. Um, grief is real. Uh, our non-pet owners may not always understand that strong connection that people have. Recognize people may not understand, but maybe surround yourself with people that do during that period of time. Um, the reality is other animals may also need to grieve. So grief is real and grief is experienced by other animals, but not all animals experience it the same. Um, so some, your horse's pasture mates or buddies may really be pretty depressed after this. So we typically would even recommend, you know, after an animal is euthanized, maybe let them kind of know that they've passed on, um, like seeing the, the body being able to investigate it. Um, giving them a little bit of time. Also, don't expect that all of them will grieve. So again, that's an individual's animal's personality, but recognize that can be a real thing. And we always want people to know resources are available um, for pet owners, whether it's a uh, loss of a horse or loss of um, any other pet. So there are grief resources that one can reach out to. You're not alone. Um, and so these are two of them, rainbowbridge.com, and then the AVMA also hosts a pet care um, page that's an animal pet loss bereavement network. So um, great resources for folks to, to think about and know there, there are people that are willing to talk uh, at any time. So, so uh, again, just some references if you're interested in um, correct technique as far as disposal or composting um, that are available for you. Certainly, I'm also willing to answer any questions that people may have. Um, and so at this point in time, I'm gonna check my Facebook um, and see mm -hmm. if anybody has any questions. Um, for me, I'm willing to stay on for a little bit and uh, chat.